when Brother Brown asked me to introduce our next speaker, I told him there wasn't really any purpose in it. He'd already been introduced before. <laughs> but he said, well, you can, you can do such a, a good job and with some background. And so I'd like to give you a little background before I get into the details here. <laughs> Back about 1977, my wife and I moved from, from the Orlando, Florida area up into Pensacola, Florida. And I had an older brother visiting with us at that time. And he and we went down to the church building. And of course, we were unfamiliar with the people that were worshiping there. We were just brand new in, into the area. And so we sat in on a Wednesday night class. And one of the students of the Bellevue Preacher Training School was teaching the class that night. And we had difficulty, my brother and I both, were trying to figure out what were these big words that were being used. <laughs> and we just wished we had a dictionary there to be able to check out. <laughs> but as, as we got home, we were talking about it. And my brother said, well, did you understand what he was saying tonight? And I said, I was having some difficulty. And he said, well, either he's one of the brightest students that I've ever heard or one of the most loony tunes when I've ever heard. <laughs> so that gives you an introduction a little bit into our son-in-law as he became later. Uh, I found in just a short time after we moved there that there was this young man who was following one of my daughters. <laughs> And he seemed to be doing that on a regular basis. And <laughs> it didn't take very long before we had a, a son-in-law. And so this gives you some idea of our speaker this evening. He was born in the city of Pensacola in 1956. And as I mentioned, he was a student at the Bellevue Preacher Training School back at that time. Uh, this was at the time that Brother Klein, William Klein, was the director. Later, he went to Taiwan and spent some time over there uh, and has served as an evangelist in local work in the state of Florida as well as Texas and Tennessee and Virginia. He's currently working with a congregation, the North River Congregation in Parrish, Florida. That's down near the city of Tampa. And he's authored two tracts, numerous articles for Brotherhood publications. He also authored chapters for sundry uh, lectureship books. He's currently married to my second daughter, Barbara, and they have three children, Sean, Trevor, and Megan. Megan's visiting with us here at the lectureship uh, here, and perhaps you've already met her. And then he also has two uh, grandchildren. This gives you some idea of our speaker. We think highly of him, and we're interested in hearing him speak. Daniel. It's indeed a pleasure and privilege to be with you. Always a highlight opportunity to have the opportunity to be a, even uh, be present in the lectureship, much less to have a part in it. We love and appreciate Brother David Brown, and this fine congregation, the elders that oversee it, and uh, the tremendous work that you continue to do to stand for the faith as it is in Christ. As I enter into my study this afternoon, or into our study, uh, I've got a simple message for you relative to time. If you expect me to give time back, D-H-Y-B, dib, don't hold your breath. Uh, I am notorious for going, or at least attempting to go over time. At any event, our study this afternoon is on uh, the subject of miracles, particularly Christ's confrontation uh, of error about miracles. 
Alexander Campbell made the statement many years ago, and it's a tremendous statement. I first heard it from the mouth of Brother Thomas Warren, that uh, Campbell said that Jesus Christ unsheathed his uh, sword at the Jordan River and threw away the scabbard. And uh, indeed, that was the case. He did not seek confrontation, but confrontation he was prepared for. He was constantly ready to uphold what was right, oppose every wrong. And uh, indeed, his word still does today. When it comes to miracles, this particular word is without doubt one of the most misused, misunderstood, and misapplied terms in the English language. Sometimes we speak of childbirth as a miracle. Or you'll hear someone say uh, concerning a shot that someone will make from a basketball court, a half court shot, or a full court shot, about what a miracle play that was. Or someone will receive news that uh, fourth uh, uh, term or fourth uh, stage cancer is now in remission, and that, that'll be called a miracle. Or uh, some other disease that is deadly in nature will uh, be cured, and that's a miracle cure. Any number of things. Uh, an auto accident that someone walks away from. Many years ago, when I was a teenager, we had a gentleman who plowed into a pine tree. And uh, the engine was driven all the way up into the back of the front seat where he was seated. And uh, he walked away unscathed. And people in the neighborhood just said, Oh, Leroy experienced a miracle. Well, it was a miracle that came in, the, in, in a wine bottle, <laughs> if that were the case. Uh, see, uh, Leroy was snockered. And he was so snockered that by the time he hit the pine tree, he had actually collapsed into the floorboard, and the engine just went right over him. So he just crawled out and staggered home, and he never even knew he'd hit the tree. He was that uh, drunk. But this is the way sometimes the word is used. Jesus, uh, the great controversialist, really helps provide us with, in the New Testament, not only him, but the apostles that he sanctioned and uh, that the Holy Spirit inspired uh, by his authority deal with this particular uh, area of thought and uh, confront the various errors and uh, misunderstandings, uh, whether deliberate or out of ignorance on the part of mankind. And so this afternoon, let's think about, study about miracles as pertains to New Testament teaching, and notice where confrontation exists. First, as to the meaning of the term miracle, there are basically five key Greek words, several terms really all together, that deal with it. Three in particular I want to focus on. Uh, if you read the manuscript, you're going to deal with uh, the five main ones. But three in particular give us an idea of what's entailed by a miracle. First, there is the word dunamis. This word we're more familiar with from Romans 1 verse 16, uh, that the gospel is the power of God unto salvation. There it obviously is a non-miraculous sense, and it is used non-miraculously in various passages. But there are a number of texts where especially it is tied to or connected with uh, the other two words that we'll be looking at, where it entails a miraculous idea, especially in the plural. And that is the idea of miracles, mighty workings, powers, and so on. This is how it's translated. This word denotes power or inherent ability, and it's used of works of supernatural origin and character in time and space, underline that, such works as could not otherwise be produced by natural agents and means. Then there is the word Samaian. This word literally means a sign, mark, or token, and it is used of miracles and wonders as signs of, of divine authority. It too most frequently appears in the plural. 
This is its basic idea and basic use, though a number of prominent appearances of the term with this idea are in the singular form. And so, again, what is involved in Samaean is the idea of visible verification. The third term is teros. And by the way, Brother uh, Terry Hightower, Brother Dove McClish have done some excellent work on uh, the significance of the word Samaya. And I urge you to uh, uh, get a hold of their material. At any event, the third term is teros, which is always in the plural, as it is in Hebrews 2, verse 4. And all three of these terms, by the way, appear in that text. We'll look at that in just a moment which is just as universally rendered wonders. It is found constantly in combination with the preceding word, Samaian. That's its most common connection. Hebrews 2 verse 4 declares that God bore witness of those who preached the gospel, talking about those who heard Christ, the apostles in particular, and uh, both with signs and wonders and with diverse miracles, and gifts of the Holy Spirit according to his will. There you have those three key words. You've got the word signs, that's Samaian, the word wonders, teros, and then diverse miracles, dunamis. The word gifts is another word that I deal with, but it doesn't in, a, in, a, in and of itself give us an idea of the nature of the miracles. It simply means a distribution. And there are many gifts that are described in the New Testament, some miraculous, some non-miraculous. Some terms are used both ways, miraculous and non-miraculous, depending on context. And so the three key words, as far as the nature of what constitutes a miracle, are these three, dunamis, Samaian, and teros. In his discussion of what constitutes a miracle, George Park Fisher gives what I believe is an excellent summation of the issue and of the matter. He says a miracle is an event which the, for uh, the forces of nature or secondary causes operating thus under the ordinary divine preservation are incompetent to produce. Secondary causes may be concerned in the production of a miracle. That is, they may be utilized, but in and of themselves they're not sufficient. For a miracle, except in the case of creation de uh, de that is, out of nothing, is wrought in nature or in the realm of second causes. But there are they, these are insufficient to explain it. It is an event which only the intervention of the first cause is adequate to produce. So we're dealing with uh, second, secondary causes that are insufficient. The activity is in the realm of second causes, that is, what we call time and space. And uh, yet, it must be uh, ascribed, the action can only be ascribed ultimately to that of the first cause, that is, God. Beyond the constant upholding of, of, natural, of the natural, or of nature, in the normal exercise of its powers, there has been an interposition of God to effect, that is to produce, that which otherwise could not have taken place. Pascal, that is the philosopher, Blaise Pascal, has exactly hit the true nature of a miracle when he terms it a result exceeding the natural force of the means employed. If the ax floats on the water, some power is exerted above the powers of nature. They, if left to themselves, would necessarily carry it to the bottom. Axes don't float of themselves. That is simply axiomatic. You want to test that, you take about 100 axes and throw all 100 into a lake and see what happens. The operation of the natural forces of things are going to, uh, is going to uh, make certain those go to the bottom. They sink. But we have a record in 2 Kings uh, chapter 6 of an axe that floated. And uh, the only way to possibly explain, to account for that happening, 
is an interposition of deity, that is an intervention of God himself, that it was direct and immediate, that uh, countered the natural effects of natural law. In a footnote, Fisher goes on to observe that by the term nature, and this is key, he has reference to the sum of secondary causes or second causes or the creation in distinction from God. And that's significant. In his manual of Christian evidences, he more succinctly states, quote, a miracle is an event which the forces of nature, including the natural powers of man, cannot of themselves produce, and which must therefore be referred to a supernatural agency, unquote. That brings us to this conclusion. A miracle then entails a direct, and immediate, that is, without means intervention of deity, of God, to produce an event which otherwise could not occur. It also involves such occurring in time and space, fully within the realm of secondary causes, which comprises the natural order. And that's going to be significant in view of a clarification that we need to observe. According to R.C. Trench, a miracle, then, is an extraordinary divine causality. He goes on to say, And not that ordinary which we acknowledge everywhere and in everything uh, belongs, then, to the very essence of a miracle. Unquote. The very nature of the event is demonstrative proof of God's direct and immediate involvement. Now, there's an important clarification and caution one problematic area of thought among some in the Lord's Church in recent years is the attempt to answer those in error concerning the false na the notions of present-day miracles, including those implying the same in their teaching, particularly the Deaver doctrine, if not explicitly teaching so, is the false doctrine of deism which affirms that God is allowing natural law to operate completely on its own. This view looks upon the universe as though it were a clock that has been wound up, a stem-wound clock, and it is simply ticking away without uh, any guidance or direction from God. The most extreme advocates of the view hold that prayer itself is only an act of obedience, a test of faith. I've often asked them a test of uh, what kind of test? Faith in what? They say, well, it's a test of faith. Faith in what? Which is not really efficacious in bringing about the results that the petitioner desires. Often those holding this view will use the term supernatural as a synonym for miraculous even to the extent that any supernatural act is automatically termed a miracle. Now here's a key point. While semantically in certain contexts the term can be so limited, that is not what it properly denotes. In fact, Fisher points out himself that there is a sense in which all things natural belong within the scope of the supernatural. Inasmuch as God rules over the entirety of the universe and the higher spiritual realm as well, which two entities, of course, comprise reality. What is reality? Reality is more than the physical realm, brethren. God is spirit, but he is still a real being. He is part of reality. And we have to understand that in dealing with this subject. When we argue that the universe, that is the material universe, is all that comprises reality, we are arguing an absurdity. Where did it come from? Did it come from that which is unreal? Thus not existent? That's a self-contradiction. It's an absurd position. In other words, the natural realm is part of the totality of those things that exist by virtue of and thus within the scope of the supernatural. 
It can then be said that all miracles are truly supernatural, and yet not all things supernatural constitute a miracle. Brother Terry Hightower has correctly emphasized this when he wrote these words. Quote, all of God's actions are supernatural in the sense that he is a supernatural being. In ultimate control, but not all of God's actions are miraculous. Unquote. That God is involved in the universe is seen in the, in the simple affirmation of Scripture that he upholds all things by the word of his power. Hebrews 1 verse 3. In this aspect of things, MacDever has been partially, underline that word, correct. However, he overdraws the matter and blurs the line in such a fashion that it is obvious that he has no longer any real conception of what constitutes a miracle, beyond simply making it a matter of the degree of power. Mac has, is in effect affirming that the difference between the miraculous and non-miraculous is the amount of power directly administered by God in any particular event. As a way of illustration, it's as though he's asserting that anything under a specific level of power X is non-miraculous, but anything from X onward is miraculous. Of course, if you ask him to tell you what specific level of power X is, he can't tell you. He has no clue. He simply asserts what, what he is teaching does not entail X or above. It falls short of it. He cannot tell you why anything under that level is non-miraculous, even though it entails a direct and immediate intervention of deity in time and space just as much as any other level of power. Neither can he illustrate any real difference existing between any two specific events involving the direct and immediate intervention of deity which make the one miraculous but the other non-miraculous. In effect, Mack's doctrine has removed the idea of, of the miraculous completely from the, from the equation. It's now a meaningless term given his doctrine. He has removed meaning from it. We're simply left to take Mac's word uh, as to what is a miracle and what is not a miracle. And it, it's just the way miracles have worked, according to him. And of course, this direct and immediate intervention of deity that he claims to occur today, all of this falls in the non miraculous. Well, how do we know that? Mac says so. And that's supposed to be enough. As long as he denies it, then that makes it so. Brother Gary Summers has written an excellent article dealing with some of these claims entitled, in fact, I believe it was a series, Leave It to Deaver. <laughs> Appropriate uh, title, by the way. Of course, now think about this. Mac's son, Todd Deaver, begs to differ with his own daddy on the matter, and is now in full fellowship with the Charismatics and the third, work, uh, third wave Pentecostals across the board. He says his dad's all wrong about it. All of it is miraculous in effect. Because that's what the third wave Charismatics say it is. Everything God does is a miracle according to their doctrine. And so now Todd is right along with them. And uh, even every breath you take is miraculous, according to their uh, view of things. Now, who are we to believe? Which diva is the one that the Holy Spirit, and both of them claim the Holy Spirit's directing them in this teaching. Which diva are we to accept has more influence of the Spirit in this matter? Neither one of them are consistent in their doctrines. So if you look at that aspect of them, you don't believe either one of them. They're both self-contradictory. Now we must caution against overreacting to the Deaver's errors that we fail to see the significant distinction we've made here. There are some actions of deity that are direct and immediate, 
but which fall outside the realm of time and space. Underline that. Remember the statement made by Fisher, and he was writing in view of the significance of those three Greek terms in particular. That you're dealing with actions and operations involving secondary causes, or the realm of secondary causes, nature. And so we're dealing with a natural realm as such, and yet they affect it. Such is the case with the daily ministrations of the angelic host, where they are directly and immediately charged by God to see to certain operations and actions within the purview of their own work. They are spoken of as ministering spirits operating behind the scenes of the stages of human history and events. I remember sitting at brother in front in uh, Brother Turner's classes in systematic theology, and Brother Turner stressing, and Brother Klein as well, that what the angels are doing are outside the natural realm, but nonetheless affecting it behind the scenes. That their operations and actions fall within the realm of providence, and this is what they meant by providence. This is exactly the idea. They were operating behind the scenes of human history and events, and they are sent forth to further God's providential work in keeping with and through the natural order. Yet the direction they receive from God is without doubt direct and immediate. We need to understand that. Furthermore, at the point of conception, let's see what our time is. While a child is physically fashioned beginning as a single cell organism, in the womb of his mother by direction of the genetic code. In other words, the genetic code is essential to produce his body. And it's passed from both parents. His DNA is not the origin of his human spirit. Somebody says, oh, I thought you got your human spirit from your parents. No, you don't. That doctrine is traducianism. And do you know who really likes Traducianism more than anybody? Certain Calvinists. And I'll tell you why in just a moment. The idea that the spirit is the product of the male and female gametes is a false doctrine called Traducianism. God, the father of spirits, actually fashions the human spirit in the body at conception. Now keep this in mind, Zechariah 12.1, uh, Hebrews 12.9, those passages, just refer to them and pass on for now. But the doctrine of Traducianism held that the immaterial spirit of man is transmitted with the body by natural generation. In other words, the human spirit, all human spirit, ultimately derives from the genetic code that began through Adam and Eve. Necessarily through Adam. The activity of God in so doing, that is fashioning the spirit in the human body, though obviously supernatural in the basic sense of that word, is not, however, an intervention into time and space that is contrary to natural law. In fact, it's in perfect accord with it. It sets aside no aspect of that law. It doesn't supersede that law. It doesn't speed up that law. It does not subvert that law in order to accomplish its design. Rather, it operates in conformity to and in complicity with that law. Nothing in the natural realm is set aside or negated by the operation. Now, the people that really love this doctrine of Traducianism are the Calvinists because it implies that humanity inheriting its spirit, in other words, you got your human spirit through Adam. When Adam sinned, you received a tainted, corrupted spirit. Hence, total depravity. It's justification for that doctrine. Obviously, that is a false doctrine. Any doctrine implying a false doctrine must necessarily be false. Secondly, 
We have in science what is called the second law of thermodynamics, the principle of increasing entropy. Everything is winding down, falling apart, tending to de decay. Our human bodies are. Our, the genetic code is. That is our physical genetic code. Now, if your human spirit is a part of the genetic code, what do you think is the condition of your human spirit today as compared to the human spirit 2,000 years ago? What would be the implication of the law of thermodynamics on that? You need to take that into consideration if you believe in traducianism. You would be implying that your spirit is more corrupt today than even that of those in the generations immediately following Adam. Do you have a more corrupt spirit than Cain? Genetically? You willing to deal with that? Discuss that aspect? Brother Hightower has done some excellent study in this area. In fact, uh, you need to look at his 1998 Denton lectures on the subject uh, dealing with neo-deism and also traducianism, especially the end notes. That's pages 648 to 666 on the subject. Now here's the point. Miracles by definition involve an intervention in the natural realm to such an extent and in such a way that God has to be the one that was responsible for the effect that natural law, the natural order, natural secondary causes, even if they're present or in some way used, are insufficient of themselves to produce. They simply cannot produce the ultimate effect. But again, it pertains to the realm of secondary causes, the realm of nature itself. Operations of God beyond that natural realm and outside of it, even though they may in interface with it, as in the case of uh, the creation of the human spirit and the human body, are not miracles. That is the operation of God on an order that is simply a part of the way in which he structured things from the beginning. And they are not miracles in the biblical sense of the word. Christ confronted error concerning the nature of miracles. The teaching that we have in these three words, the implications of these words, refute the Dever doctrine, brethren. They refute also deism. They refute traducianism. They refute all sorts of other false doctrines concerning the nature of miracles. Furthermore, Christ confronted error concerning the source of miracles. I wish I had time to discuss Matthew chapter 12 at length. Simply don't have it. But Matthew 12 centers on the conflict between Jesus and the Pharisees over the source of miracles. When you read that chapter, you will note the Pharisees do not deny the fact that Jesus performed miracles. They admitted that he actually did the miracle. That he was indeed casting out demons. What they did was ascribe the operation to the power of the devil, to Beelzebub, the prince of demons. It's as though they said, yes, it's a miracle, but God didn't do it. That's a self-contradiction. And Jesus deals with that. The very nature of a miracle, by definition, is God is the ultimate author of it. And without Him, it otherwise wouldn't have happened. That's the idea. And the logic that Christ uses in refuting them is overwhelming. It's powerful. We have brethren that are, uh, I think Terry uses the phrase logophobics. Really, that means fear of words. Logophobia is fear of words. But to, uh, he speaks of them as being fearful of logic. And they are. I don't know how many times on discussion list I've seen brethren, some of them supposed gospel preachers, 
talk about how we can't use logic to prove anything. And some of them will say, oh, if you, if you believe you know something to be true, you are arrogant and so on. You know, what I like to ask them is, do you know who you are? Do you know where you live? Or do you need someone to guide you to where you think you're supposed to be? If it is arrogant to affirm that you know something to be the truth, then you can't even affirm that your own identity. If you're not sure who you are, then why don't you on your paycheck start putting Daniel Denham on it? Because I know who I am. <laughs> Call me arrogant all, out, all you want. I'll be happy to cash your checks. I mean, these people are absolute uh, absurd in this. But this is where they are. This is the nature of postmodern liberalism. Jesus refuted the arguments of the Pharisees, or the quibbles really, that sought to ascribe this to the devil. And he proved that instead the devil was very much alive and the casting out of demons was in opposition to him. The devil didn't like it, the demons being cast out. He was opposed to that. But Jesus was able to defeat it. Further, Christ confronted error concerning the design of miracles. The teaching of Christ on miracles as well as his use of them confronted and still confronts error in this regard. While the world, especially men, are seeking power and influence and will often boast of extraordinary accomplishments and powers that they ascribe to miracles or as miracles for fame and fortune, this was not the nature of Christ's teaching on the subject. You don't have, when Jesus went in and performed healings, you didn't have the brass band going in ahead of him, and you didn't have signs being put up, come to the healing services of, of Rabbi Jesus. You didn't have any of that. You didn't have strobe lights and all of the, the falderall that goes with these holy roller campaigns. Jesus went in and performed the miracles for two basic reasons. First, to reveal the will of God and to confirm that will. That's basically it. And the same was true of the apostles. When they went out preaching the gospel into all the world, the Lord went with them, confirming the word, signs following. Mark 16, verse 20. And so their message, that the preaching of the gospel, came not with enticing words of man's wisdom, Paul says, but in demonstrations of the Holy Spirit and of power. They backed up. You know, <clears throat> these folks that claim to have what Paul has had, they ought to be able to do what Paul did. Proof's in the pudding. If you say, I have all... Uh, D.L. Welch one time said, I've got all the power of the Holy Ghost. Well, he lied. <coughs> he didn't. But if he did, he could have done anything and everything that uh, the Apostle Paul could do. Or Peter, or any of the Apostles. But he couldn't. Marshall Keeble, invading him in Mobile, Alabama, I'm told, stood up and challenged uh, him to go down to the local cemetery. And, uh, of course, Welch wouldn't do that. He just hi tried to laugh it off. Brother Keeble, on another occasion, in a debate with a Pentecostal preacher, said, in fact, we'll not only go down to the local cemetery, I'll show you I have more power than you do. You tell them to get up, I'll tell them to stay down. <laughs> now, that'd be a demonstration, wouldn't it? But the design and nature of the miraculous was to reveal and confirm the word. Isaiah 28 verse 10 shows or alludes to the fact that revelation had to be by its very nature gradual uh, in uh, its unfolding. For precept must be upon precept, precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line. Here a little and there a little. And Isaiah goes on to point out that was exactly the way in which he carried out his own ministry in verses 11 through 13. 
When your little baby toddler comes along at the age of three or four, and you're trying to work on the car, do something out in the yard, and they work, walk over and say, Daddy, what makes a car run? Do you try to tell that baby everything there is to know about the operation of a combustion engine? No. You give the information to the child on a level that the child can appreciate. And it's as factual as you can make it, but it is very limited in scope. God did not reveal everything to Adam and Eve the very day they fell. God did not even reveal everything to Abraham when he made the Abrahamic promise. He did not reveal everything to Moses or David, not even to, to the Apostle Paul in one scope, one pop. Everything was gradually unfolded. And that required by its very nature a confirmation of that which indeed did come from God as opposed to that which did not. So that men could know, because they didn't have it in solid written form, they could know this is God's will, this is not God's will. This is what I must do, this is what I must avoid. And so we need to recognize the difference in design. But there are other things pressing on very hurriedly that uh, of conflicts relative further on the nature of miracles. For one, the nature of the miracles performed by Christ can be seen in a brief listing of some of them as representative of the whole. And there's a listing of that in the manuscript. I exhort you to do that. Uh, these particular miracles are so dramatic and so spectacular as opposed to what's uh, claimed today uh, it, it's, uh, there's just no comparison. Think about just simply the fact that Jesus raised the dead. In the case of Lazarus, in John chapter 11, he raised a man who had been dead four days, meaning he was already in the state of decay. The soft tissues were already dissolving and falling away. Various other aspects of his body were in putrefaction. And yet, he was raised from the dead, and I am convinced on the basis of what the Bible teaches relative to the scope, the full scope of the miracles, that he came back. He had a full liver. He had a full ki both kidneys. He had uh, the, a heart, a functioning heart. He had a functioning brain and everything else, all of which would have been in the process of decay at the time the miracle was performed. The man whose ear was restored, Malchus, there is implied in, keep in mind, it's cut off. Do you realize what is involved in just surgically trying to restore a severed limb? And we do it imperfectly. We don't, this, is done, this was done instantly, immediately, without medical surgery, without medic, uh, natural means. You're talking about the restoration of the tissue, the bone. You're talking about the cartilage. You're talking about the nerve endings. You're talking about the tiniest capillaries. Every single cell and every single atom comprising the cell being restored and made whole. We can't do anything com comparable to that. That was the nature of the miraculous of Christ. Thank you. I hope you really listened. That was rich. It was just so very good. I was thinking um, what all that meant in just one passage where Paul said, Though our outward man perisheth, the inward man is renewed day by day. It can't be therefore subject to the second law of thermodynamics and the law of entropy. Because everything physical is going down. But Paul said the spirit is renewed day by day. So while our outward man perisheth, which is quite obvious to all of us as we look at one another, we're not getting any younger. But Paul says the spirit is not subject to that. 
It's being renewed day by day. And that's just uh, amazing when you think about Jesus saying to the Pharisees, don't say that you have Abraham, your father. God can't all these stones raise up children of Abraham. You know what that means? He can take that DNA code that said it's a rock and just by something like Lazarus come forth, just a brief thing, change the whole thing to where they come out just like, as far as their lineage, just exactly like those Pharisees. That's the God we serve. So I don't give any thought as to him taking care of his part in the matter and all his exceeding great and precious promises to us. I'm just concerned about David Brown doing what he needs to do to benefit from all that God can do that none of us can do for ourselves. That's the, when you contemplate these things, your mind just kind of, it, it, it just can't, it's too great for us. It's just a, a, amazing. And regarding the, the sign, you know, a miracle's a sign. Well, a sign's not a sign of itself. It's a sign to somebody else. But if, say, take Moses. If Moses, sign, if everybody could do Moses' signs, how'd you recognize Moses? If everybody could do what the apostles did, how would you know who the apostles were? And if everybody could do the miracles Jesus did, who, by the way, had the Spirit without measure. The apostles had the Spirit with measure, even though they were great wonders. Then uh, how would you know who Jesus was? So if you blur miracles, everything just a miracle, how would we, how would we recognize even in print that Jesus Christ is the Son of God? Yet John says, and many other Signs truly did Jesus in the presence of his disciples. They're not written in this book, but these are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. And what he did is just a further elaboration on how far that goes and how it helps us expose a false doctrine. Brother Daniel, I, I wish Mac would accept the debate we've offered for several years. I might take this opportunity, in fact, since this is going out, just to say we still are waiting. But you're not going to dictate to us how we do things. And uh, since we decided that Brother Michael would be the one to handle the negotiations uh, with Brother Mac and with Daniel, then it still stands that way. And uh, you're not going to change that. But if you really want to debate, it's very clear that you know the propositions that represent your position. And we know the propositions, too. We know the proposition we're willing to affirm ourselves. So wherever this message is going to, if it reaches Brother Mac, I assure you we have no animosity toward him. Some of us work with him and would love to do it again. And as far as Todd is concerned, I had him as a student. We're not talking, for some of you, let it be known, we're not talking about people we don't know and that we've never worked with and have never been our friends. I, mean, I really think he would say that. So why not just be willing to not try to dictate everything there is about it before you'll try to debate it? Well, our time's up, and we've got a few minutes here, so we'll come back in in about five minutes for the next session.